Merci Damien Robitaille. If you're yeah. not following following Damien on Twitter, uh, he is a really feel good. He's been he and his dog Suki have been posting uh, for the throughout the whole pandemic yeah. music that he makes himself. Uh, yeah, and that's a song of his. He's a uh, uh, amazing. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everyone! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> We're sending you hearts zip, do, through the zip, Zoom. Do, do, do. Is that a hat? Is that hair? Or am I wearing an Easter egg hat? I, I think you have my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so good. As long as you don't get mine. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Wonderful. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, a very, very happy uh, Valentine's Day. We hope that you are taking this day and every day to make sure that the people who love you um, uh, uh, know that you love them back and all of that wonderful stuff. And also, you can't love anybody unless you're taking good care of yourself. That's so, right. uh, oxygen mask on first. Take, take the opportunity to do that on this Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just changed the security, but I think there might be a couple of mics open. His oh no, I just residually. muted everyone, Hooray. just in case. Us too? Uh, hello? Is this on? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think we are, yes, I think we're good. Okay. All right. <laughs> Folks are still coming in. Come on and get comfortable. We, we just got here. I don't know if you can tell how out of breath we are, or I am. <laughs> <laughs> you just ran here from a union meeting. I was just at a union meeting. I just ran here from an interview. Oh, like right there, right next door. Yeah, like like <laughs> on the other side of the wall. Yeah. I was like, ha <laughs> um, Okay, so um, uh, big announcements. No, um, we will be posting the seminar three grades um, by the end of today. Um, and uh, we're just a couple hours running. We had a, a thing with one of our team and some health challenges, but everything's fine, and uh, we'll have those up by the end of the day. Um, and uh, what else? Hi. I've got my brain is full of Damien Robitaille. So yeah, yeah, like I'm still kind of Bob Land the moon. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. So shall we get zip started then? Zip zip the elephant zip is very nearly zip done. Zip 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 this is a great, uh, yeah, the coloring thing, one. this is a fun okay. one, when yep. it becomes resplendent and it's... <laughs> okay, and, and I don't family, see anyone else joining us. For our four-year-old, uh, the yeah. arc-en-ciel, like rainbow, if you have a noun or a verb, he can up it to the nth degree by applying the adjective or the adverb rainbow. So like an elephant, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. But a rainbow elephant? Way better. That's a better thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Somebody's drawing a heart. Uh, stole your heart. It's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel pretty, like that's something Dexter would say. That's a, that's a pretty good heart. That's well done. <laughs> like, well done. Okay. Great. So, gone with a mouse. <laughs> we have a screenshot of this. We do. Uh, we will. Now we do. <laughs> uh, wonderful. And uh, there we go. And clear all drawings. Get ready for today. Paladina, Today's fun. Paladina, when will we be getting the topic test back? Uh, we would just Ooh, yeah. meant right. That was uh, no, mentioned? that was seminar three. So, oh, okay. uh, so just to kind of go over again, the the general policy, the the goal that we all kind of shoot for when we have these large classes with these things to grade is about two weeks. So the university um, has this policy of within about two weeks. We'll keep you posted again. Uh, so long as there are no health challenges that we come across, we we should be. Um, on uh, on target for for that. So the Monday after the two week Friday kind of deal is is what we're we're hopefully going to be able to to make. Okay, um, ready? Here I we go! Am. Yay! Okay, so oh, today is niche day. Like, so naively, I'm like, how do I not know this? It's niche day. Wow. Wow. It's but a good you're day. just trying to pull my leg. It's niche day for us in this space. <laughs> yes. Like if we go out and hand out niche. It's lines. not like international niche day. 
like, if it was Nietzsche day, that would be like... Uh, because then Smith would be going around saying to people who pronounce it incorrectly. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So I think we've talked about this in this class. If any no. of you... Um, this we're going to be talking about niche fundamental and realized and they're different but they're they're conceptually connected yes. but it's pronounced niche it rhymes with quiche it does not rhyme with rich like the word niche does uh because there's no t and there is an e so yeah. when, once you become who you're becoming and you travel to the excited states of america and they talk about the fundamental niche just go <laughs> <laughs> or we could recognize <laughs> <laughs> that sometimes pronunciations can vary. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, there's no paradigm for that that I understand. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, it is it is a kind of like cross-border type of a difference. So we say niche in the United States and we say niche most of the time in Canada, although some of us still say niche. And it's okay. Um, yeah, there's better things. <laughs> there's judging going on. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's like, there's other answers are available, <laughs> but they're wrong. Yeah. So here we go with uh, just a follow up for uh, those that uh, did the homework using the diagrams that we gave you. If you want to see whether or not you got um, the same answer, go ahead and fill it in. For those of you that haven't done this homework, you will not be able to answer this question. So don't worry about clicking in. <laughs> Give other folks some time to join us as well, so that's good. How's Lily doing? Lily's okay. She's not feeling great. No. Oh. No. Everybody think good thoughts for Lily. <laughs> Okay, just a few more seconds because it was kind of, you know, either you're going to answer A, B, C, or D, or it's like all E. So, yeah, it's uh, no problem. Get your answers in. A few more seconds. There we go. Thank you. And E is totally fine. Oh, Lily, you've got lots of love in the cat. <laughs> Oh, yay. Yeah. My lily girl. Okay. <laughs> Although, as a Gen Xer, I read that as being lily, lily, less than three. And I was like, well, I mean, that's a little harsh. <laughs> I give her a six out of ten. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So lots of you are participating, which is great. I will uh, stop this now. Because, um, like I said, you either did your homework or you didn't. And if you didn't, then... Don't worry about it, though. Uh, the answer, according to my calculations, is B. Um, so go ahead and um, either celebrate, tap yourself on the back, or um, take a look at uh, your calculations. Of course, only if you used the ones that, that we gave you to do them, it should be B. Um, and uh, if it isn't, go and see if you made a couple of you know mathematical errors. That's less important than the actual process of going through and making sure that you understand how those numbers are moving, right? So um, <laughs> use them not to like, the end goal of this exercise isn't to get like 1.6. The end goal is to reflect on the process that you went through to get 1.6 and how that could change from like 1.6 to 1.9 and like what, what sort of biologically important things need to change in order to change those numbers. That's really what we're focusing on. And as you saw in the first uh, topic quiz or the, the what do we call them? Topic? Topic test. Topic test. <laughs> that they, um, like, it's not ice cream cone. It's uh, making these kinds of questions is a really, really high level way of studying. So yeah. making your own questions like this. So take those diagrams and toggle and them. Change them. Change up the number of species. Change up the abundance of one. Yeah. Give yourself, like in your study group, give yourself some assignments where, like, okay, you are going to go and change the abundance of things. You're going to go change the diversity. You're going to go change the, I don't, whatever. But, but, play with them like that so that you actively give yourself some, uh, yeah. some of those, the jobs of making these questions. Yeah. 
Super. Okay, cool. We'll move on if there are no... Yep. Yeah, okay, good. So, um, we're going to... Oh, that minty isn't really showing up very, very strong, but hopefully you can still see it. Um, we ha uh, have a mentee prepared for you to ask you what might be some of the reasons for why a species is not somewhere. So not the other way around. We did that one the last time. So why might a species not be somewhere? It's a Yoda way of asking a question. That's right. I kind of, it's, I, I, it's more of a cat in the hat thing for me. Oh. Um, but anyway, uh, here we go. We'll present it. You're already starting, so that's fantastic. You can put in multiple answers. That's totally fine. Um, but this is, this is great. It seems like you're getting access. So the code is 14866688. Wonderful. <laughs> Earworm. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Oh, caramel's here. All of the animals are in the hey, room right now. There's five beings in the space. Yeah, it's very tight. Um, oh, oh you know, who, you know who's not in the house right now? It's our Is children. Our children are not here right now for the first time in months. Eight weeks, nine weeks. Yeah, they're at school. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so lots of really good things here, um, and I think I, I mean I I don't think there's like any wrong answer that I've seen so far. Um, but let's take a look because what I would love to appreciate is, you know, that they're part of different categories or different scales, geographic scales, levels of organization, all of those types of things. They can kind of be like described, right? Um, so if we just take a look at temperature, lack of resources, resources, limited resources, wrong climate, 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 climate. Climate, climate change, <laughs> um, abiotic factors, very good, uh, not good climate, good habitat destruction, so that's a change over time, right? Competition, mm -hmm. um, human activity, inadequate soil nutrients, um, this is great. So, yeah, all of these different things. Um, can I, and I always like to add this to lists of reasons. Um, you know, you, you have the kind of like the, the shit happens reason, so changes or, you know, some kind of destruction, but there's also the, meh, it just never happened reason. Shit hasn't happened yet. yet. <laughs> the, the just kind of random, eh, it just never, you know, it just was never there, right, um, can also be a reason. Um, and uh, what we want to do is we want to kind of think about the implications, how we might go about figuring out what the reason is for a different species or a particular context, you know, that kind of deal. You know, trying to figure out why, for example, polar bears are not in Antarctica. Um, Plane it's kind tickets. of fun. <laughs> it's kind of fun, right? Um, so let's kind of let's work from there. And 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 you know, there are some delightful explanations for why things ended up where they are, where they shouldn't have been under more natural conditions, right? Like uh, reindeer on South Georgia Island, which is a subantarctic island, um, can totally survive there, do very very well, and were brought there by people. Um, where in sort of normal circumstances under natural conditions, they never would have made it. So, so it's kind of neat to kind of explore those um, boundaries, I guess, of, of habitation. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's do that. Um, we can take all of your answers and kind of combine that, like kind of put them all together into sort of four larger categories that might be helpful. So um, several options include it was here, but it isn't anymore because it died out, right? Yeah, and some of you had that in terms of extinction. And, and no, yeah. I don't know that anybody said chance, but chance is a huge thing there. Yeah. Um, number two, it can't live here. So this is the majority of what your ideas were about, like the limitations of temperature or soil or yada, yada, yada all of these amazing, beautiful abiotic factors. Yeah, it could live here, but it just never got here. 
And maybe you say ellipses, 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 dot, dot, dot. It's like Yet. they're texting it in the great evolutionary drum of life going, oh, it's coming. It's <laughs> okay. coming. And number four is it could live here, but other species are keeping it away. Right? So, so yeah. The blocking. <laughs> the species blocking. Yeah. Okay? So think about it. How could we test these possibilities? We notice that a species is somewhere and then isn't somewhere else. How could we go about setting up an experiment or two or three or basically a career worth of like inquiry in order to figure out what the reason might be? So with that, we kind of need to appreciate two, well, one concept, but two like sub concepts, right? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is the the it's like monophyly, paraphyly, polyphyly, but these are the, the important thing is the niche as niche. the concept and then two subtle ways of thinking about it that, that get you really understanding the concept. That's yeah. my argument for it. Okay, good. So niche. And unfortunately the word niche, just like the word normal, um, is used in different sort of contexts by different types of people, so it has different meanings. Um, so normal in, bi in biology or in science is about the bell curve distribution. It's very sort of specific. Um, and the same thing goes with niche when we think about it in terms of biology. So when you're like Googling definitions, it's always a really good idea to put the word biology after it so that you get the definition, you know, that pertains to mm. biology if you're, you know, studying for a topic test or, or, or taking a topic test. So um, niche. And <laughs> biologists are terrible at coming up with definitions of things. <laughs> it's just kind of a state of being. Um, and, and you can use the word niche in as many ways as you can use the word species. Is that fair? Uh, I might disagree, but let's, let's keep okay. going. Cause I, I, I like the, I do like the fact that there's multiple. So, so the fact that we can't, that we have multiple definitions of species, I'm going to bring this to where I, I fully agree. The fact that we have multiple definitions of species is not a weakness of species as a concept. It's an expression of the complexity of the question. And that's, and so niche is kind of the same thing that there's a lot of, I'll call them axes that we can think about that. Yep. Yeah, and so it becomes so it becomes complex when we start to understand what niche is and what it isn't, and our definitions of niche can really restrict sort of the diversity or, or sort of a celebration of the diversity of, of different species. So it's it's kind of really important to keep an open mind when we talk about niche um, and um, not worry too much about defining it, but rather than thinking about how it might relate to a specific context or a specific species. So niche generally is the role that a species plays or the kind of kind of multi-dimensional space that a species occupies. So we can talk about it with respect to, you know, this this multi-dimensional space that it occupies or we can talk about it with respect to its relationships to other things. And that's why we have to keep on like an open mind when we talk about um, uh, when we talk about defining it, okay? But it's it's basically the sort of sol the the group of variables and characters that uh, that relate to a species um, that are not its own sort of personal traits. But they do include abiotic and biotic factors. Okay, yeah. great. It, we'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> but let's focus first on a lot of you had some abiotic factors. In fact, one of you said abiotic factors, which was really good. So um, we can think about niche and about this space. And space is, is, to me is more like on a graph matrix, not like right here space, right? Um, so like if we take all of the variables that are important to a species, when we talk about um, uh, the fundamental niche, we're talking about this sort of multiverse space that it occupies on this multivariate graph. Um, so we can talk about, you know, temperature and precipitation. We can talk about light availability. And some species, of course, don't need these and others need, you know, quite a bit of it or several of these um, in order to be able to thrive and survive. So obviously there are tons more abiotic factors that can be included in this list, but here's just, a, you know, an example. And so when we talk about sort of abiotic factors when we talk about like the the requirements of a species um, we're really talking about its fundamental niche the 
conditions that it needs to survive and thrive, where a species could potentially live, okay? And a graph that's maybe not quite so multiverse, multidimensional. <laughs> Well, any graph that starts in a multiverse has to start with a two-verse. That's right. And then you add verses. That's right. So if we can, we can think about a niche with respect to one variable, the graph might look like this. Again, it's got our normal distribution, which is very satisfying. Um, and we could put the abiotic factor, so let's say temperature, uh, on the x-axis. And we can put the number of surviving individuals. Let's make it you know, something simple like bacteria, easy to understand. Um, and then what we can do is we can plot, you know, the number of surviving individuals based on temperature and we get this nice surface area that looks like this curve, which essentially would be the niche with respect to temperature for this species of bacteria, right? So that's kind of one variable, but of course the world isn't composed of just one thing. So it starts to get complex very, very quickly, and that's why we talk about it in terms of space. So we'll show you what that looks like. With three factors only, right? And again, the world is not just three factors, but after that, like, my brain can't keep track, so... Well, there's a reason that Marvel has made a lot of movies that's right before entering the multiverse <laughs> if they'd started with the multiverse people wouldn't have gone nah. okay so we'll show you what the space looks like and hopefully it'll be a little bit more clear when we talk about these these um ranges of tolerance and 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 potential uh potential niche right so we have envir environmental factor number one number two and number three on an x y and z axis okay so if this is going to be the space that the species occupies, where it survives and thrives along environmental factor number one, we can then know that the range of tolerance is somewhere here. Let's say that this is temperature, right, that our, that our bacteria are surviving in, no problem. Outside of this, life is no good for them. So this is their, their range of tolerance. Along the x-axis, let's just say that that's going to be, or sorry, we're doing z next. <laughs> Along the z-axis, let's just say that that's going to be pH. We can say it's pH, and during in that you know range, they're surviving and thriving. Um, and then y, let's say that this is salinity. Um, and then again, this would be their three-dimensional space for these three variables. That would be their fundamental niche. Of course, it's not just about abiotic, it's also about biotic. And many of the things that you said fell into the biotic categories, right? You talked about competition, you talked about food availability, there's food availability right at the top up here. Um, a whole bunch of biotic factors that play a role. And what's kind of neat, it's not perfectly aligned, but it's kind of, you know, big conceptually aligned, just like, um, you know, uh, convergent evolution and um, uh, homoplasy and um, uh, polyphyly, like all of those things kind of were part of the very similar type of category. The same thing applies for abiotic, biotic, fundamental, and now realized niche. When we talk about biotic, we're largely talking about realized niche. So let's kind of put aside the fundamental niche, the, the potential space that a species can occupy, and think about the um, realized niche, which is where they actually occupy. And that can be largely driven by biotic factors. Yeah? It's not an easy concept to explain. No, nope, I think this is a fine way to start though. Okay. We could start with a little scenario. Uh, let's bring in this <laughs> poor John. Peaceful John. Peaceful John is a goldfish that lives in a bowl. Um, and Peaceful John has a little house and life is pretty peaceful. 
So if Peaceful John lives alone, we could uh, plot Peaceful John's fundamental niche. Let's just stick to two variables, nice and easy, right? So it could be temperature and pH, for example. Um, fish, probably it would be more like temperature and nitrites. Um, but, uh, but basically, Peaceful John kind of occupies this space, this blue space. And as long as the water in the bowl doesn't go outside of this range of blue, uh, Peaceful John is a very happy fish. So that's Peaceful John, fundamental niche being respected within the context of the bowl, okay? But it's not always that way. And now we're gonna be adding a biotic factor. So imagine if one day Peaceful John wakes up comes out of his little house and badass fish is sitting there smoking a cigar and badass fish is like not a nice fish right um and Clearly, so he's <laughs> combusting tobacco underwater right super inconsiderate yeah um and so <laughs> something's got to give something has to happen right and so obviously i hope that that you're thinking that peaceful john represents one species badass fish represents another and with the introduction within this sort of confined space there has to be some kind of response right so especially if their fundamental niches overlap and now they're overlapping uh in terms of like the same habitat it can become a problem so imagine then that badass fish is introduced into the fishbowl um, and now what we see is this change in peaceful john where john is now adapting in some way to sharing the space with badass fish what we see then is the emergence of the realized niche the actual sort of multiverse space that peaceful john is occupying in the context of this this biotic factor right that's right. Thank you so much. Can you put like a speech bubble around that coming out of <laughs> coming out of out of badass fish? This niche ain't big enough for the both of us, right? Like there's got to be some kind of um, some kind of adjustment, right? Good. Thank you, Rachel. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, that's great. So, um, biotic factors, right? Do play a role. They're they're important. Abiotic factors also play a role. If we wanna to try to align up these concepts, like what I was saying before, we can do it by not only, but like a lot of the fundamental niche space is defined by abiotic factors, unless you're like, what, like a like an obligate parasite, or, you know, there are wonderful examples, and, and Smith there, is like, there's there, so many differences in the invertebrate world. They are wonderful and numerous, but yeah. this is a this is an important place to start. But yeah. realize that for every fundamental, for every John and badass fish, that's right. And this is a great place to think about for the this this tank and the simplified environment in the house. And there's probably thirty different parasites within each of them for whom John and the badass fish and those biotic interactions are fundamental. That's right. But and you can put those aside for right now <laughs> and, if you're trying to remember these two concepts. That's right. So fundamental is where they can survive. Lots of abiotic variables go into explaining that. And then biotic is where they actually survive in this multiverse space, right? So maybe they don't stay within the full range of their temperature because there's some other bacterial species that's occupying that temperature part, right? So this is what we're talking about. So basically the fundamental niche gets reduced to the realized niche in the context of the biotic factors. Not always, but those are sort of big general trends. Okay, good. Anything mm -hmm. that you wanna add there? It's great. It's great, okay. So what can happen? This is kind of the fun part, right? To understand the general concept, but then to go, well, let's see what happens when we put badass fish in the fishbowl. And of course, there are many different outcomes because it totally depends, not only on the species, but like on the environmental context, on the other pressures, on all sorts of other factors that, that are going on at the time. But there are three that we want you to kind of be able to uh, work with or describe or identify sort of evidence for that type of thing. The first one is competitive exclusion. So basically, Peaceful John's 
in his little fishbowl, badass fish comes and Peaceful John pieces out, right? Either through extinction or through range shift, right? Is that okay? Okay. The next one is called character displacement. And this is through an evolutionary process, largely, although there are some really cool stories where it's like in the actual individual they're adapting, but also through an evolutionary process where over time, the sort of realized niches of the two species are distinct enough so that they don't really compete. And so what might happen in our Peaceful John Badass Fish story is that maybe Peaceful John becomes a nocturnal species that only comes out at night um, and uh, Badass Fish is a diurnal species and so is very active during the day. So they don't actually overlap in terms of competing for resources because they just divide them up you know, by, by day and night. And then uh, coexistence at a reduced carrying capacity is another possible outcome. So imagine, you know, there are, you know, there's a population of peaceful Johns in the bowl. We introduce badass fish. Peaceful John doesn't go extinct, but definitely doesn't have the same population size as it did before. So this is a reduced carrying capacity as a result of the, comp the competition uh, or the relationship with badass fish. Quick question for you. I don't know if I have a poll. Let me check. Nope, I don't. So just hold off. We'll stamp it, but just hold off until everyone can read it and get your stamps ready. So badass fish moves into Peaceful John territory and over time the Peaceful John species becomes nocturnal. Which type of response is this? And go ahead and stamp. Super good. That's great. <laughs> okay, that's great. Cool. So that was just kind of like rapid fire, different possibilities, but they have, you know, different consequences and the way that we would design experiments or studies in order to figure out which one is which are going to be different, right? So they all come with their own assumptions and that kind of deal. So one of the cool ways that we have explored these kinds of ecological differentiation, processes of differentiation that lead to evolutionary different trajectories is using birds. We started out, as we do with a lot of things, using paramecium. There's a, there, the competitive exclusion was most probably the first definitively shown using two different species of paramecium gliding around in petri dishes eating slightly, forced to eat the same thing. But these two super friendly looking individuals, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who used to teach in Canada uh, at both Trent and at McGill, and then uh, through the processes of not even competitive exclusion, but lack of recognition uh, for the two of them at, this, at the correct career trajectory, they were hired away uh, by Princeton University in the excited states of America, where they went, and they took their studies, which at the time were looking at kind of neotropical bird assemblages, off and on islands, um, at the, when they left Canada, principally off the coast of Mexico. When they went to Princeton, they started going farther afield, afield, which is a strange thing for islands in a marine environment, farther afield, off the Pacific coast, and into... Oh, that's a strange arrival. Uh, into the Galapagos, and they started looking at sparrows. They were look they're ornithologists, so they were looking at sparrows. And this is the famous example: um, Darwin's finches. Darwin had collected finches all over these islands, like he had collected all sorts of, from fossils to just unfossilized rock to fossils in rock, and all sorts of iguanas to birds to insects to tortoises. That was his job, and. He didn't. He talked about kind of in broad strokes about how some of the birds look different and which one of these birds might be most similar to the birds that he'd last seen on the South American mainland. But he was doing a lot of things. He was a busy guy and a bit of a fuddled guy, and it took him a long time to. He, he just kind of he sent he shipped them back 
and there his sparrows sat. Finches, rather. So these finches, it's from an order of magnitude. Yeah, they're all, yeah, they're all birds. They're all birds. <laughs> you said sparrows, and rate, I was like, oh, but then I was like, no, you know what? I say vertebrates all the time. Yeah, so. at any rate. <laughs> One of the things, as other researchers consulted the samples that he'd sent back to collections and that still sit in collections in the British Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. they noticed the fact that a lot of the morphological differences in these nominally one or two species of finch became more species of finch when you looked at them morphologically and you saw a species that had large differences in their bill morphology and that they were restricted to these islands. And so some ecologists, including Peter and Rosemary Grant, got grants to go out there and to study these finches in situ, living, not museum collections, but living on these tiny islands. And they were able to find islands that had, um, for instance, Los Hermanos, which had this large kind of narrow build um, Geospiza fulginosa, which is the bottom one. And so narrow being like top to bottom, narrowest the nose down to like the bottom. And then on Daphne Major, this kind of bleak, um, Tiny island. There's a great big honking bruiser of a geospiza, uh, geospiza fortis. Strong, big beak. Yeah. It's strong, and it, they seemed uh, to eat different things. Those bill morphologies that were associated with different sizes of seeds that they ate. Different now, hardness. Yeah. Yeah. That other badly timed animation on our part, that floating orange no exclusion zone, was the coolness of their experiment on Santa Cruz, where they could find both species. Yeah. What they found when they were doing mist netting and, and capturing these, let's call them dinosaurs, <laughs> was that when they measured, they could look at the, there, there wasn't, Every, not all the Geofortis had the biggest beak. There is a range. There's that range. nice distribution right up there of, of purple, that histogram from 8 to 12 uh, units, uh, probably centimeters. Millimeters. Millimeters. <laughs> <laughs> They're like monsters. I need to eat hockey pucks. <laughs> millimeters. And then slightly from, from 10 down uh, to 5 or 7, Fulginosa, so that narrow beak. Now, this is largely on those two islands where they are only found. So there's some overlap, right. but where they're yeah. not found together on Hermanos and Daphne Major. Right. On the island where they're together, zip, 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 <laughs> they differentiate and they, and they segregate. And so the largeness of the Daphne Major, of, of the Daphne Major Geofort, Geospiza Fortis is accentuated. They're getting even bigger, and there's more of them that are bigger. Right. And the narrowness for the grassier seeds of the Fulginosa is emphasized as well. And the small ones become even smaller too. Um, and this was kind of a classic explanation or a classic experiment to demonstrate uh, niche differentiation. Now, the thing that's important to recognize is this is not speciation. These are two different species already. They are not interbreeding. They are not like, you know, hanging out in some way, trying to like figure shit out. They are, uh, over time though, what's happening is there's been this selection pressure that's pushing, right? The distribution of these traits of the trait of bill depth, um, or beak depth, same thing. Um, uh, in opposite directions because those that are kind of in this over that were in this overlapping space um, were less competitive or, or were less um, fit than those on the out on the outside of that competitive space so this is a, kind of one s a simplified presentation of one of the experiments that grants have done over a career's worth yeah. of research and there's many many other researchers and they span this kind of niche ecology, but also through different El Nino and El Nino events where these um, segregating niches get hammered by other abiotic factors and these species kind of get forced together. So, so there's really subtle and beautiful examples of this ecological differentiation that when consistent through time leads to speciation. Uh, and you can read about them, uh, some of them, up until probably 15 years ago now, yeah. or longer, uh, in this book, In the Beak of the Finch, which is a lovely... It's a lovely book. Lovely book. Super readable. Yep. Okay. Cool. Take it on a canoe trip. Yeah. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Let's go well, on a canoe trip. A can yeah. 
Oh my goodness. So, um, one of the types of questions that we might ask as ecologists is, how would you determine which abiotic factor is limiting the distribution of a species, right? So why is one species where it is and not where it isn't? <laughs> What's kind of driving that? Um, and we can look at it from biotic factors, but in this particular case, this question is asking about the abiotic factors that might be limiting. So we're focusing more on, you know, more fundamental niche than realized niche, but, um, <laughs> uh, and that's niche with a Y at the no, end, right? Not Frederick. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So um, we can do a bunch of things, right? We could do field observations of the actual range of the distribution. We could determine the ecological tolerances of a species. That might be a more sort of lab-based kind of study. We could look at correlations between known uh, environmental gradients and a species optimum range. We could do experiments, so we could field transplant things and, and control different environments. And it can, those types of approaches can be used to understand very large patterns, right? So if you remember last class, we talked a little bit about sugar maple distribution movements over time, right? Uh, over the last, uh, you know, 14,000 years, I guess it was. Um, and so here what we have is a map um, that documents the range or the presence of sugar maples uh, in North and Central America. Um, and the factor that's being used to explain this is simply temperature, where, you know, sort of north of uh, the northern range or limit is set by monthly winter temperatures that are um, uh, at like minus 18 degrees Celsius. So they don't like the super cold, right? Um, and here we have monthly temperatures that are over... Um, uh, 24 degrees Celsius, and so they don't like the super hot either, right? And that's just one variable that can be used to explain, for the most part, the distribution of sugar maples. Um, you can see these little patches, which to me is like super interesting, right? What's going on there? Let's bring back that laundry list of other that's factors. That's right. Yeah. So it could be that, you know, these areas um are uh higher elevation for example um there could also be some other interactions going on right with all sorts of um uh you know habitat loss and things like this right that not only just remove the species but also also change the temperature profiles of those places um and so there's all these interactions that that become uh really you know important to understand And so I love this is another reason when we're talking about niches and species, species are fundamentally phys um, philosophically, they're fuzzy things. They don't just have a hard edge and edges and boundaries and range limits is an expression, a map or a physical based expression of a niche limit are also very rarely, even when they appear hard, they are often quite fuzzy. And so if you were to do your kind of CSI, let's enhance that image, let's enhance, 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 well, you find something that on the left-hand side at that scale looks quite cut and dry. There is the tree line, it is here. Below on that eleva elevational transect, there are trees. Above it, there are not. But as you zoom in, enhance. And you zoom in and enhance, it's like, oh, well, it's fuzzy now. It's fuzzy. Yeah. And we've, we've supervised a student, for example, we asked them to, to draw a map of the dairy bush and to put the line of the dairy bush trees, like the canopy, versus the field. And that was a hard she, thing. There was some, she struggled. I think some maybe some eye rolling beforehand, because yeah. it was like, it's pretty, there it is, until you go out and you stand there, and you're like, well, am I in it now? Well, it's clear when I'm way out of it. Yeah. But when has that actually happened? That's right. Because we said we would like you to sample at least 50 meters from that line, right? From that from that delineation between the two. And she was like, oh, I don't know. But then she went and she found all sorts of really cool information, right? Using biological data, using um, uh, biodiversity data, using uh, historical data. Um, and, and there are like three different lines, essentially, right? Depending upon what perspective you take. So it's kind of cool. And
and we have to figure out how to study all this stuff, right? So, boy, is it easier if you do it with plants. <laughs> it's so much easier with plants. Um, but imagine we were trying to figure out tree line and why tree line is where it is. Um, and why then species don't survive on the other side, or if they could survive on the other side. And one of the tools that we have available to us is a transplant study, right? And let's just, for the purposes of the explanation, just suspend the idea of ethics. Let's just pretend ethics are not a thing or a problem. Um, and of course, ethics are a big problem, right? When we transplant things, like just don't do it. But if we're going to be uh, setting up, the, like from a scientific experimentation perspective, um, we might transplant things outside their ranges or existing ranges to see whether or not they survive, right? Now, of course, we could do this within uh, a very controlled environment, which wouldn't be breaking any any ethical concerns. But um, but so let's just imagine that you know all of the the ethical concerns are 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 met. Um, and we're going to be looking at a tree species within its actual range. We're going to be transplanting some individuals from the actual range to the outside of its actual range. Um, and then we also have to transplant from uh, within the range to also within the range, right? So we have to do, uh, here we, we uh, dig up some trees or some of the plants and we replant them within the actual range. Some of them we dig up and we plant them outside of the actual range. And we plant them outside of the actual range, we count which ones are going to survive and which ones are not. So why would we, um, plant, transplant something within its actual range? Why would we dig up a plant and just replant it within the actual range to see if it survived? What might be the reason for that? Yeah. Yeah, some of you in the chat right away producing Good. the word control. A control, right? To make sure that what you're doing isn't actually causing the death. That's right or promoting the, the growth That's right. of what it is that you're measuring. That's right. There could always be an effect of handling, right? So for example, imagine if all you did was take a whole bunch of trees and transplanted them outside um, and they all died. It, I mean, that's something, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of sad, but, um, but it won't actually tell you whether it's a species that just can't survive transplant. Yeah. I had a friend during my graduate degree who was measuring the snout vent length of frogs, which is a standard way to measure the frog's size. But they did it um, after the frog had been hit by a car until uh, someone produced a, a suggestion at one of their theses, their committee meetings, which was like, maybe you need a control on this because I can imagine the car going over the frog changing the snout vent length, how far apart the vent was from the snout. Yeah, oh, that's... Pauvre frog, yeah. pauvre grenouille. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so this type of experiment has been done um, just along a, an elevational gradient um, to be able to try to understand what uh, is going on in setting that tree limit for some species, even at different, I mean, it's not like it's just a hard and fast kind of, you know, all species beyond this point cannot survive. So there are many different species that have, you know, within a general uh, margin, um, uh, some kind of limit with, with elevation. So the study that, that we'll kind of work through um, for homework um, is uh, this one, where uh, they had three different treatments of planting trees uh, outside of their range. Um, so just imagine that they all survive the control, okay? So um, they replanted um, species underneath a canopy, so they were shaded and had competition for water with other species. Some were on bare soil, so this means that there was lots of light and no competition for water. And then the third condition was on bare soil surrounded by a herbaceous canopy. So this was lots of light with competition for water. So those were the, the two different types of variables that they were mixing up with these three different conditions. And what we've got are um, the results. Now, I've, we've made these up, um, not, not, well, we've made up two different possible results, right, so that you can practice on, 
uh, two different um, stories or two different cases, okay? So imagine for experiment one, these are the data. Um, so uh, these three conditions, low light, competition for water, A, B, C, and then the percent survival in each type of condition. Uh, and then we've mixed things up a little bit to give you a second experiment to practice on as well. Um, and what we'd like you to do for your homework is to come up with a conclusion about which is important or less important, light or competition for water. And we'll take that up uh, the next time that we see you. Take care. Bye. Yep.